I had a friend uh, piss in a bottle, and then I went to the off the doctor, and then I squirted that piss into the cup, and then I passed the drug test. So the only real test that I nailed in high school was my drug one, and I <laughs> cheated. Hello, and welcome to the Roast of Your Teenage Self podcast. I am your host, your roast coming queen, a girl who has spent every past episode still talking about her high school theater program, Elise Morales. And with us today, we have such a funny stand-up writer and one of the co-hosts of the Dollop podcast right here on the All Things Comedy Network. But before all of that, he was a graduate of the University School of Milwaukee. It's Gareth Reynolds. Hey. Hey. All right. So excited to have you. Um, University School of Milwaukee sounds very fancy. What flavor of high school is that? Public, private? Preferably? It was a. It was a. Uh, pri- it was a private school. Um, I went to it. It went went from kindergarten all the way to high school. So oh. I hung in there for the whole time and uh, got in a lot of trouble and uh, yeah and did and yeah it was a lot a lot of rich kids and then and then some of the kids who were uh, a little more like me who were like Jesus Christ our friends are rich <laughs> and, uh, but that was great too because it's always yeah you always had an indoor pool to go to was that well that that is a beautiful thing it was great. Uh, was there like an, a, a religious affiliation to it at all? Or was it just like fancy people of all stripes are welcome here? It was not religious, but it, I always think back on this because we had to sing before we ate lunch every day. And I, it did not occur to me as crazy when we did it, but we used to sing, this is amazing. God is great. God is good. And we thank him for this food. Amen. And I like, as I get older, I'm like, that is fucking bananas yeah that is it's not even like a prayer it's just like a real like it's like with something like a principal wrote it was like there we go that's biblical <laughs> yeah no this is this is good this um, is good and then they can eat the hash browns and chicken nuggets because of god because he yeah. made them <laughs> god god had a hand in this like nasty uh, the square yeah he's in the back with a hairnet like i hope they like it how do they like in the macaroni good okay Really, like, when I think back on the food that I ate in school, I would say a, an abomination to God. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, if he was into nutrition at a bomb, I mean, the, what you could eat at school was crazy. When I, I mean, I, there was, a, there was a, a brief respite when Michelle Obama was like, hey, these kids shouldn't, pizza shouldn't be a vegetable. But yeah, it was, I, I enjoyed it, but oh, I, I, it was also garbage food. I mean... When I got to school in the morning, which was, first of all, at like 6.45 a.m. I think about that all the time as well. Just, Same. it's the, that was the worst job I ever had was going to school. Horrible. I would never, I would never accept a job on those terms. No, yeah. no. And where you, and you work at home. Home, I mean, it is complete indoctrination without question. Anyway, sorry, keep going. Five at 6.45, you work for nine hours. <sighs> test you regularly and then you get home and there is more work like Ugh, not, lots more work absolutely not accept that when I got to school in the morning I would pound we had um like vending machines and I would just have a full sugar coke that yeah. was every single day yeah I would do the same I would just pound caffeine all I would take um what the hell would they like amphetamine essentially I would be like taking like Vivarin or whatever and um and that's before i like i discovered my friends had ritalin and stuff but i would take like i mean i was just like a tr- i had like the diet of a truck driver because the hours were so ludicrous and the work was so tedious i mean do you remember like i think like when people fly on planes and you see the guy who's like mm-hmm. like head nodding himself i was i mean my my goal like after lunch every day was to be like how do you actually stay up and awake I would always, I would wake up because I would get that sensation. Like I would start, I would have a dream that my desk was falling through the sky. And that. Right. Where you have those little dreams about like, I should pee. And then you're like, I dreamt I pissed. And you're like, but I didn't. It's just like very linear dream logic. Yes. And, and then you get like, I remember I would get in trouble for falling asleep in algebra. And I'm like, babe, it's 7 a.m. And this is the most boring shit I've heard in my life. I wish I had the balls to call my teachers, babe. I would <laughs> love to be able, like, lighting, having a cigarette. Like, babe, would you calm down, babe? I'm, 
I'm asleep. Babe, it's relax. I'm a little tired, okay? I overdid it on the vino last night, baby. Come on. I did have an antagonistic relationship with my algebra teacher, Mr. Hubach. Um, these names, they don't, they, why is it that name teacher names, I've like 55% of them I've never heard in the real world again? Absolutely not. What uh, was his name? Mr. Hubach. I mean, it sounds like a euphemism for genitalia. It does. And he, well, I had a very antagonistic relationship with him. And one time I had to meet with him after school. And when I walked in to meet with him, he was eating two hot dogs at the same time. Well, like uh, was he entered in the like hot, was it July 4th? Was it Nathan's? Privately eating two. Was he dunking them in like water like they do in the competition and just pounding them? They were, they were fully dressed hot dogs. And he looked at me and I looked at him and like, it was understood between us that the meeting was not going to happen because I, oh. I just like went to my bus. I was like, well, like I, I don't have to listen to you. Yeah, I was like, listen, man, we're not going to go over the test. You're double decorating hot dogs. This is not, <laughs> I don't listen to you. You no. listen to nobody. Yeah, exactly. Wh who are, who's giving you rules? Yeah, who, who trained you to train others? No, no, <laughs> Mr. Hubach. I had, I had Mr. Lang as my algebra teacher. And he had, like, before I even really knew what LSD was, I was like, this man has definitely taken a lot of it. And you could literally say, Mr. Lane, will you tell us about the time you went to the Pink Floyd concert? And he'd be like, we're not doing that again today. <laughs> Very quickly. They had a giant pig, and he would, like, draw the and he would, like, do it. He, like, he loved the experience so much that he would be like, five minutes, I'll tell you about the concert. So since you were at a school that, like, you started from elementary school, was there, like lore about teachers once you got to the high school like were you like oh my god you don't want to have this person or this person if you ask him about pink floyd he's he'll tell you <laughs> yeah you definitely had a sense of like um i mean because it was all, all sort of connected too so it was like you you would kind of uh know who the teachers were i mean you wouldn't necessarily know too much but yeah, you would definitely be able to get a vibe and you were familiar with who was in charge and familiar with who to be afraid of. And then also just people that you would see as like huge intimidating people. And then you'd finally be in their class and you'd be like, oh my God, I'm in Doc's class, you know? Um, but yeah, definitely. I don't know if it was an advantage or not because you would be, you know, you would definitely be, I was just scared all the time by teachers because I, I was not good with authority and not good at school. So was that like, did that follow you? Like, were you a troublemaker from day one or did you like grow into troublemaking over the course of your time there? I was a troublemaker the whole time. And then I think I really found my voice in high school, like mid late middle school, high school. I was like, I can be a huge distraction. <laughs> like I definitely, I, I mean, I, multiple issues. I mean, the, the school was very uh, strict. I had to wear uh, a tie and a sport coat. And so I just was like, I would forget things and I would have to go to the lost and found and I'd end up wearing, like it looked like Tom Hanks at the end of big. <laughs> and, um, and so, uh, but yeah, I definitely, I think eventually I just was like, I had so little interest in school that I really did. I was like, I'm here to have, make laughs, make jokes. That's, that's my purpose. Did you, were you like known as a class clown at that time? Did you win class clown? No, I, I definitely was known as a class clown. I mean, it was actually a big disadvantage because I would go into classes now and teachers would, no, no, they would immediately be like, oh, this kid's a shithead. Like, you know, I was on probation when I walked in essentially. <laughs> um, and so they, I, and then I didn't win best class clown. When they gave those awards, I was very disappointed because there's some really good ones. There's like most likely to be success, you know, all these really nice ones. And I won uh, most likely to leave campus during a free period because I smoked cigarettes. So, <laughs> so I won that and I was like, that's not good. But I mean, it was, the word was out that I was, I, a lot of my friends got expelled. And so my friends were all these kids who were at a public school. And so they would come and pick me up and stuff. So the school eventually was definitely frowning upon me and, and my crew. So it's kind of like you won the bad boy award in a way. I guess I did, but I wish they'd put it like that instead of just like most likely to drive to have a cigarette was just sort of like yeah. that's depressing. Yeah, most likely to like smell kind yeah. of. Yeah, stinkiest kid. <laughs> yeah, most likely to have yellow fingers. So what was some of like, what was your biggest trouble? Do you, do you remember the, the things that really got you, got you in the hot seat? 
Uh, there was a lot. Um, there was a time when I, I mean, I smoked weed in high school and I used to go to this, uh, this, this guy, Mike Z's place to buy weed. Classic. And, um, and he, he was, he, he had like, a, he would always be benching and playing video games, like right on dealer brand. And, um, a kid got in trouble for something unrelated to it, but he, he turned myself and a couple other friends in for being at this guy's place. And then, so I ended up getting uh, randomly drug tested for the rest of high school at one point. So your high school had the authority to... They had the authority to, they had the authority to say, if you want to be here, you have to do this. They were not like, I mean, you know, yeah, it's total bullshit. I mean, I knew it was bullshit then and I didn't know anything. Um, did you like, did you try to get past the, the drug test? Did you do any like... I cheated on a drug test once, yep. I, uh, I had a... <laughs> <laughs> I did not know we'd get here. I I had a friend uh, piss in a bottle, and then what I did was I put it in an oxy bottle, like oxy, like for pimples and stuff. And I put it in an oxy bottle, and then before I was going to take it, I was in the shower, and um and I filled the sink up with warm water, hot water, and I put that in there, and then I went to the off the doctor, and then I squirted that piss into the cup, and then I passed the drug test. Wow, <laughs> pretty ballsy. And then I also was able to, I took a uh, golden seal too, which was a thing then, which was like, would help you beat it. But that yeah. was like my secondary point. I remember always hearing that you could take niacin to beat your drug test, which yeah. I, I never had to do, but that was always, I was like, that's really important information for me to know. <laughs> oh yeah. I was definitely, once I beat one, I was like, all right. I'm, and they only gave me one. That was all I ended up having was one. Um, and, and I won. So the only real test that I nailed in high school was my drug one, and I cheated. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Luxuriously coming at you in my college improv sweatshirt, Could I Be Cooler, to tell you that today's episode of the Roast of Your Teenage Self podcast is sponsored by Candid. You know all the things that we'd love to do for ourselves but haven't done for whatever reason, like getting any other sweatshirt. For me, I always wanted straighter teeth and a better smile. You know, I, I never had braces in high school. Never had that experience. Never had that day where you got the braces off and you came to school and everyone was like, oh my God, she's a woman now. But I'm done putting it off. And thanks to Candid, straightening my teeth is simpler, easier, and more comfortable than ever. Candid clear aligners are comfortable, removable, and practically invisible, unlike wire braces. So you can transform your smile without anyone noticing. Plus, your treatment is prescribed and monitored remotely by a licensed orthodontist who's an expert in tooth movement. And that's all done from the comfort of your own home. Candid not only works with orthodontists, never general dentists like other companies, plus your supervising orthodontist will be with you every step of the way. So you can get that full, I'm 14 and my mom told me I got to get my teeth fixed feeling without, um, having to look like you're 14 and getting your teeth fixed again. It's a beautiful thing. With Candid, your treatment includes remote monitoring by the same orthodontist who created your plan, so you never have to wonder how you're doing. You'll always know, and I love that. The average Candid treatment is just six months, and you'll start seeing results way before then, and it costs thousands less than braces, because face it, regular braces, really expensive. You're gonna need mom and dad to be footing that bill. Not now, not with Candid. So start straightening your teeth today. Right now, all of my listeners can save $75 on Candid Starter Kit. Go to candidco.com slash teen self and use the code teen self. That's candidco.com slash teen self, code teen self. Take advantage of this limited time offer to save $75 on your starter kit. CandidCO.com slash teen self, code teen self. Get that smile popping, people. You know you want it. <laughs> you cheated. And I cheated. And I cheated off someone else. <laughs> it's also like 
so crazy to think about like carrying piss around with you. <laughs> Man, when you are that deep into this weird, I mean, they, they, I mean, it's really, it's how society works in a way. It's like you build the fence, we'll figure out a way to get through it. And it was just a good example of that where I was like, your rules are really bullshit. So I will fight your bullshit rules with more bullshit and yeah. see who wins. And like, worst case scenario, I was going to go to the school where all my friends were. So what was that like? What was that like having like public school friends, but then also being at this fancy private school? It was weird. It was really weird because um, I mean, I, I, I definitely had friends from my school, but they were also friends with kids from the public school. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, I mean, my school did not like me towards the end. It's, it's really sucked, honestly, it, like became very difficult. And, um, and, uh, and my friends, I, the truth is that I, my parents had such a shitty marriage. I was really going through a lot of shit. And so I definitely leaned on like partying. Uh, and I enjoyed it. It wasn't like, I was like, what's wrong? I wasn't like Janis Joplin. I was like, this is great. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I definitely was struggling and the school did not really take an approach of like, um, you know, they, they just looked at the behavior and didn't really look at the root. And so it, it really made me want to rebel more, but I was definitely, I had teachers who really liked me and were like, you know, he's a good kid. He's a funny guy but uh, he's lost. And then I had teachers who were just like, I don't want to deal with this. And um, it just became a very frustrating experience where I, I, you know, barely got through it, honestly. Well, I feel like that's so interesting because obviously like on the dollop, you guys talk about history and stuff. So you have like, like you, you can be, could have been interested in that subject perhaps at the time if someone had found the key to your brain. Well, they don't, they don't teach, they did not teach me. I, it, it honestly shocks me all the time on the podcast because we'll, we'll talk about a subject that I'm familiar with or a person who I'm familiar with, like Harriet Tubman. Yeah. And, and then when I go, I'm like, Harriet Tubman in my high school was just a footnote. There was real, there was very little to it. And then the reality is that she was like the baddest person. <laughs> like she was such a badass. And it's, it, it honestly, it's very bizarre because I do think it is a calculated decision in curriculum to potentially not, it's not, maybe not necessarily like a race thing, but it's like, she didn't take shit. She fought the system and she, you know, put a lot of dents in the system. And I think that they are like, you don't want to hear about these radicals too much, you know? I, um, so I think, I think they choose to not teach you the stuff that is maybe not necessarily important, but like, uh, you know, revolutionaries. And so I, I think that all the time, yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that you're definitely true there. And it's so interesting because especially with history, like I'm, I'm a history lover and I feel like you have to go out of your way to make it as boring as they make it. Where they're oh, yeah. Oh, you should actually learn the dates of all these battles instead of like what Harriet Tubman was actually up to or yeah. Tom Brown or any of that stuff. It's like, that's really interesting. And this battle is the like boring as shit. <laughs> totally. If they had taught John Brown, I mean, that is a, like an amazing story that they just choose to not teach. I think also because you have to kind of, you have to kind of cover the tracks to some extent of the racist history of the country. So, you know, there's, probably not a ton to choose from. And a lot of it is based on bullshit, you know? Like you spend time learning about Christopher Columbus. And it's like, and then you're like, you know, 10 years later, you're like, wait, what the fuck? Or Thanksgiving. And you're like, these stories are not real. These are not real stories that they've taught. You are at this school for like so, so many years. What was your, like, did you, um, did you do extracurriculars? Were you involved with sports or were you just like, I'm partying, I'm making trouble, I'm not in, like fuck all this noise. I actually, I had, um, I had, I mean, I, I, I had a couple things. I, I started doing improv. I started doing comedy sports in high school, and then that was great. That kind of opened me up to like, uh, this world that was just totally separate from school and was just about being funny and having fun. And then I had a teacher uh, named Miss Woodard who came to the school. I think my sophomore year, and just was like she was like, you have some ability. And she like actually made me go like, oh shit, there is more out there. I had no plans to go to college. I didn't really know what the fuck, I thought I would stay in Milwaukee and kind of try to do comedy sports. And she was like, 
um, you know, let's, let's get you going somewhere. And so theater became a thing I did. I still was very, um, yeah, I still, I could have focused more on it because, but, I, but she definitely like lifted me up to a level where I actually had like belief in something. And that was just something I hadn't had in my entire high school. So by the time I was a senior, you know, I was on a path where I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go to college. I'm going to pursue some version of entertainment. And um, yeah, I mean, it's super lucky, super lucky. What got you to comedy sports? Did you just like see them and think like, I'm going to try out or? They had a high school league. They had high school leagues and a friend of mine, I mean, this is sort of, and it, to what we were speaking about earlier, where an advantage to being in the same place the whole time. So my friends would have older brothers and sisters and one of my friend's older brother's friend, who they would just beat the shit out of us when we were middle school. But when I became a freshman, he approached me and he was like, hey, I run comedy sports. You should join, you know? And I was like, oh, great. Fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I've beaten you, Seth Sisley, and you came back for more. <laughs> uh, and then that sort of got, that got me into the high school world. And then that actually, when I was 16, I started working there. Um, so that, I mean, it was just, yeah, the, those, those two things taught me that, um, I could actually go outside of the school to some extent and find things that gave me purpose, you know, that I enjoyed doing. That's so cool. Cause like something we've talked about on the podcast a lot is like how long it takes to get to that realization of like, Oh, comedy is a thing that I could do. And so by doing comedy sports and being like, Oh, okay, well this is the high school league, but I see that there's an adult league and this is actually, I'm working here now. It's like you got kind of at a young age, to see that a career in comedy is a real thing that can happen. Very true. Yeah. It, it, I especially, I mean, I, you know, I was from, well, I was from Brown Deer, which is a very small, I mean, it just, the concept of being able to do things I saw on television did not have, I just, there was, there was no connection. I mean, I, mean, I you know, I watched so many old sitcoms. I was like raised by sitcoms and television, but it never occurred to me that all that useless time watching it and sort of locking in how story goes, you know, subliminally would come in handy later in my life when I was like, oh, I'm very familiar with the structure of how television works. And shit. Exactly. It's like, oh, actually, I have an encyclopedic knowledge of some of the best television pilots. That yeah. <laughs> I was like, I know everything that James Burroughs does. Mm -hmm. And I'm you know, like, it's, it is very weird. But, um, but yeah, it, it, it's certainly like, it was it was just a very lucky break on it to be able to sort of like see these few pathways out of there and actually lock into one and, and get out because otherwise I, I remember i was at, at comedy sports i think i was 18 maybe or 17 and i was talking to one of the guys who worked there who i thought was like a, the best and he was i mean he's just comedically hilarious and um and he was like get out of here he's like don't say more he was like seriously he's like i i wish i had left leave <laughs> you know and i was like oh shit Cool. Thank you. Yeah, uh, interesting. So, okay, you're doing improv like outside of school with this group. You're you're troublemaking, which I feel like takes a there's a certain confidence in yourself that it takes to be a true sure. troublemaker. Yeah. Uh, you're you're partying all that stuff. Is this like sort of confidence that you're bringing on stage, that you're bringing in the classroom, translating to other parts of your life? Like how? How, how was uh, teen Gareth with the ladies? I, I, it's funny. I actually was, um, this happened in college too, where, that, well, in high school, pretty good, honestly. Like there were, there were certainly like, I mean, for like, yeah, I mean, I, I think I did have like kind of blind confidence. And um, so there were definitely, you know, I definitely dated some girls in high school, but when I got to college, I really was so clueless. Like, I remember the end of my freshman year, like a girl was like, there's a lot of girls who have crushes on you. And I was like, really? I don't, like, I just never actually really connected those dots. But, but I did pretty well in high school for, you know, for a shithead who was, didn't know what the <laughs> hell he was doing, you know? Bad boy award. So well, what I started doing was I started to wear, uh, my last year or two, I went because I think they changed like some uniform rules or something. So I got platform shoes. So I wore these huge platform shoes and I wore bell bottom khakis and um, just took, uh, I mean, I think there's some in the pictures where you can see that I am a lunatic. Let's um, put some photos. Cause you actually have some great looks. Well, this photo, this first one, is this the school uniform? This was, this is actually the, I'm wearing the platforms. In this. Yeah. I was about um, to 
We got to talk about the shoes. <laughs> well, okay. So this is my la This is me graduating from high school. And so there is Mr. Uh, Cornwell with the blue cape on. Apparently he was a super uh, teacher. Mm -hmm. And, and he, he was the dean. And he, he was very stern with me, but also understood that I was a shithead. And so he kind of had like, he was kind of cool to me towards the end. And then I decided what I was going to do was I was going to tuck a monkey tail up in my jacket. And then when I finally got up there to get my diploma, I was going to let the monkey tail drop. So if you look there, you see a little monkey tail popping out of the back. So everyone's laughing and I'm shaking hands with the like headmaster guy. And he's like, not sure why everyone's laughing. And I'm like, it's a pleasure. It's an honor. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, and I remember asking the Dean that day, I said, can I get in trouble if I do something here? And he goes, look, this is your last day. You can do whatever the fuck. And I was like, okay, great. I do love that the shoes weren't enough. You were like, I also need to be wearing a monkey. Well, well, they were, to me, at that point, I was like, these are shoes. These are not funny shoes. These are just my, these are my shoes. These are my heels. <laughs> they look like, like a little boot. And I mean, they're, they're, I would say that they're stylish now. Like I would wear those shoes, but it is interesting to see them on a teenage boy in his school uniform. I, like I said, I don't, I, who knows? I mean, I would go to the, I've got, but, 95% of my clothes from the Goodwill. And I really don't know where a lot of these, I look back and I really don't know what the hell, it's not, I feel like it was a different person. Like, I don't know what the hell is going on in this person's mind, even though it is me. But this person was just like, yeah, he was just like, I'm a rock platform shoes and then I had this monkey tail. Um, I don't know what I was going for, but something happened. So I took it, you know? Perfect. Let's see. <laughs> Next photo here. Okay, so this looks like it's you and the crew. Um, yeah. What's your is, choice here? This is probably freshman year. Um, and these, or maybe sophomore year. So this is one, like, I mean, I mean, look at me. I just look so, I, okay. I found great solace in Kurt Cobain. Like Nirvana became, and then he killed himself. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, yes. And then, uh, and then he killed himself. And then I was like, oh, my only friend is gone. Um, but I'm in a Nirvana Nevermind t-shirt. I think we're probably drinking Sprecher beer here. I don't know where we are, but this is my, this is on the left there, on our left is my friend Brian Harrison, who is a lunatic, a lunatic. I, the first time I went to his house, we were probably freshmen, and he goes, hey man, we can, he was, uh, he was Ecuadorian, and his whole family is Ecuadorian, and he was like, it's cool, we can smoke cigarettes in my room. I was like, okay. And then his mom was knocking. She's going, Brian, Brian! And I was like, and she goes, it smells like smoke. And I was like, can we smoke? And he goes, yeah, it's cool, fuck her. And then she came in and we were smoking and we couldn't smoke in there. <laughs> and so we were in tremendous trouble. And I was like, Vargas, his middle name was Vargas. Then there's my, a buddy of mine who I still keep in great touch with named Brett Stepke, uh, who's bald now. And then my buddy Graham over there. And yeah, this is just us. I mean, this is kind of what it was. It was just a lot of sitting around in people's basements or when people's parents were gone, just drinking beer and rum or whatever we could get our hands on and just being- <laughs> Those years, yeah. like running around a finished basement, wreaking havoc on like a very nice suburban home. Oh yeah. Well, my also I eventually turned my basement into a crazy little party den. Like my brother was twelve years older, so he really greased the wheels for me. Um, he like had gotten a DUI. Like he just like had, there was like trouble there. So I was able to kind of just be like, hey, it's not abnormal to smoke pot in your basement. Don't freak out, mom. You know. Um, do you, was, would your brother get you beer? Where were you getting your alcohol from? We actually would get our alcohol from multiple places, but before any of us had fake IDs, there was a, a mentally challenged guy who a buddy of mine worked with at a gas station named Lance, who just didn't give a shit. And he would get, the orders were, and I'm not even trying to be rude or anything, like he, the orders would not be correct. But we would be like, this is fine. Like, we'll smoke menthols and we'll drink this shitty beer. What, you know? Yeah. Um, well, at that point, like, when you're going to Lance with your order, you are making a deal with the devil a little bit. Like, you can't be like, um, sir. I know. Yeah. Not yet. Yeah. You can't be 15 and be like, um, I wanted a light beer. You know, you're just like, I will drink it. I'll drink it from a hat. I'll drink it out of a boot. I don't give a shit. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I, we've, this is something we talk about on the podcast a lot, too, but just like, the insane alcohol that you would drink at that time, like, oh, yeah, like making like Everclear drinks. It's like, you know, you don't have, you can also get drunk and not do this. 
Yeah, I mean, I would never, literally would not know what Campari is, except for the fact that like I stole a bottle of it once and it had alcohol in it. And I, I just, and vermouth too. Right? Drink yeah. vermouth, just like down. Oh, we used to drink vermouth and Diet Mountain Dew. Like, reg and it, it, it tasted as horrendous as it sounds, but we were like, as a play. Absolutely burned a hole in your stomach the moment. Oh, yeah. Oh, without question. There, there will be a doctor someday who will be like, well, it's inoperable. Was yeah. it fun? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this looks like, it was this vermouth and diet coke? <laughs> You've got a bit, what we call a vermouth hole. Uh, it's right in your tummy. I'm a doctor who says tummy. Yeah. <laughs> It's, this is not a doctor. Um, yeah, no, it's Lance. Lance! It's Trump's doctor. Um. Yeah. yeah, it's that first one who looked like uh, a Val Kilmer character. The, guy, the first guy who's like, I don't know. He's the healthiest man alive. I don't know. He's, he wrote the note. I don't know. Eventually, that guy just gave up. He's like, I don't know. I don't want to be interviewed. <laughs> I'm over this. Um, all right, let's go through some of the other photos, because you sent in some really good ones. Okay. Um, okay, this... Okay. <laughs> This year with a young lady, is this a costume or is this what you wore to homecoming? It's a great question. Um, it's a great question. Uh, this was, I believe this was the other school's prom. And this is my girlfriend at the time, Beth. And uh, this was not a bit. This, I like, to me, this... Again, like I'm saying, it feel I feel very separate. I would love to sit down and talk to this person <laughs> because I don't understand it either. Somehow this happened. I don't really know how. It looks like I invented steampunk. Yeah. Um, white gloves. That's a cane, clearly. Uh, Glasses, a, sunglasses. Shades inside. A top hat. <laughs> Just not not okay. Have you ever seen that vi it was like it's like a viral photo that comes up every Halloween of a woman who showed up dressed as the Babadook to like a movie watching night and no one else is dressed up? No. This looks exactly like <laughs> that photo. I feel her vibe. I feel her vibe so strongly. You you look like you can't showed up dressed as the Babadook. <laughs> I I mean, but look at Beth. Like Beth is not like Hey, let's be crazy together. Beth's like, I'll wear a dress to prom. And I was like, I'll, I'll look like I have a train that goes through time. <laughs> you look like Beth. Beth got this photo back and was like, I was in this photo alone. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Or yeah. I, 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 I mean, it, like, she, it, it, this is where I learned that I'm a ghost. Like in my life where someone's like, you were never there. I'm like, oh my God, that makes sense. I'm a ghost. You're like Beth went to prom alone. You are dressed kind of like a dandy. Like there's like an Oscar Wilde. Yeah, the look doesn't, the f actual facial expression itself does not help get away from that either. This is, it's the, it's the, 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 the grimace of a dandy. <laughs> <laughs> so w was this a long-term girlfriend of yours? Uh, this was not that long-term. It, I mean, it was probably a few months. She went to the other school, like I said. Um, but yeah, she was definitely like, maybe like, yeah, like certainly one of the first girls where I was hanging out with for like a good amount of time. I think we're probably juniors there. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think we were probably on maybe for about four months or so. But like, yeah, she, she was great. She was awesome. So given that like you were at this school for such a long time, did you mostly date people who you met outside of school or because it feels like you would have known people for such a long period of time that maybe the the pool of like cool new girls to meet was well small. but the, you know they, it because of the adolescent transformation it became like a fresh pool at, <laughs> in high school you know it was sort of like oh my god you're not just the girl I threw clay at you're attractive you know um woman. so to some extent but then I also think it, it was sort of helpful in a way because it was like, if you'd known someone for so long and then they came out on the other side of adolescence, you know, and you were attracted to them, it was a little bit easier to be like, you already knew them. It wasn't like going to high school and being like, oh, there's all these new girls I don't know. It was sort of like, we all got older together at the same time and then kind of came out the other side like, hey, I'm weird now, or like, I'm a fat kid, you know, whatever it was. 
Um, but, uh, but then also, yeah, definitely like I enjoyed going to the other parties and like meeting girls I'd never met before. You know. What were like, um, I mean, you said you were into Nirvana. What were also your like other cultural touchstones at the time? Um, I really, uh, there was uh, David Cross and Bob Odenkirk had a sketch show called Mr. Show. Yeah. And, uh, and that was like, I would only get videotapes from friends of Mr. Show recorded off of HBO. But I remember when I'd get a new season, um, that my my really good friends and I would watch, like my friend Brett, we would watch, we would just, we would burn holes through these tapes watching Mr. Show. Like it was, it was just unlike anything I'd ever seen before and actually completely um, changed what I wanted to do. And like when I got to uh, college, you know, got into a sketch group and then I was like, holy shit, I'm going to be writing, you know, sketches. And, and everything I had was like, Mr. Show esque was like either like adjacent to Mr. Show or something like that, but that that was a huge huge uh, influence on me. That 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 in conjunction with comedy, sports, and theater, you know, again, like when you are so, I mean, I really did not do well in school. Um, when you're like that, you feel fucking useless because that's really the only bar to measure yourself by is grades. And it's so when you don't, stop. it's your yeah, yeah, it's the, it's the boss's approval. And so when you're not good at it, you feel like shit. And so when I actually was going, oh, there's, there are these things that not only do I like, but I get validated from people about doing, you know, I mean, that was just like, it was just a matter of putting a sail in that gale force, you know? Yeah, theater was definitely like that for me because I was like, just kind of like a middling student, but I knew that I was good in plays. Yeah. It, that feeling... Uh, you were talking about with Mr. Show. I got the same thing when my friend lent me the first season of The Office, which I mm -hmm. think came out like my senior or junior year. And I remember watching it and just being like, I've never seen anything funnier than this. Like, yeah. this is unbelievable. Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting too, because even when I go back and I'll watch some old Mr. Show, it's, it's not as, it's not as great. I mean, some of it is amazing, but it's not as great. But the influence it had on me was it just kind of opened my eyes to like, you can, there is no limit to what comedy can be, really. I mean, you can do anything in a theater. Well, sometimes also watching shows that are so influential like that, you'll watch a joke and you're like, oh, that joke's done to death. But then you have to remember, no, this was the first time it was done. I watched like Planes, Trains, and Automobiles recently. And it was, and I was like, this movie is not as good as I remember. And that's exactly why, because they've made that movie 20 times since then. And sometimes just as good or better even, but that at the time was a pocket in time where it was like, this is, this is the best of this ever. Yeah. It's like, oh, actually you're watching it be invented when you're watching right. this show. Yeah. Let's go through the, the rest of your photo. Okay. Here. Um, okay. Let's see where, okay. Oh. Who do we have here? So that's my brother. Uh, like I was saying, he was the one who greased the wheels for me. He's 12 years older. Um, this is when I dyed my hair and eyebrows black for no reason. And, um, and this, I showed him my every, it's very funny because every Sunday, my mother lives in England and my brother uh, and I, we see each other, but we, but so we do a uh, family photo time, my brother, my mother and I, mm -hmm. and we go through old pictures. And when I found this one, we were like, this really summarizes, this is the epitome of our relationship when I was in. I was a fucking lunatic. I was out of control. And my brother, would, my brother was awesome and very cool, but a lot more docile. And so this is me like making him wear me as a backpack. And he's just like, Jesus fucking Christ, just get off of me. His face truly looks like he's like, well, this is my teenage brother. Yeah, he's <laughs> like, I expected more from being Batman than just having this <laughs> asshole on my back. But but he was cool. I mean, he would like hang out with us, but I would, uh, one of the things I would do is I would always sing songs to him and he would just punch me. Like it was just, it was pretty basic. <laughs> so, okay. You just dyed your hair and eyebrows black because you were like, it's time for a change. Cause you want to be shocking. I'd had my hair bleached blonde and then, yeah. And then I think I just, I don't even, I think actually, I believe it was supposed to be like a temporary thing and then it was permanent. And then I was like, oh, whatever. I think someone was like, this is a temporary dye. And, uh, and it wasn't. I, or so, no, someone goes, it'll wash out with Prell. That's what it was. 
And so I bought this Perel and I was like, when the fuck does this shit come out? And it just never came out. So I had black hair for like. Five. And it's like, actually, if you put black hair dye on fair hair, it's yeah. not going to come out. No, it's, it's black. It's black. And yeah, so this is a, an interesting phase, but. How long, it, did it, how long did it last? Forever. I mean, it, grew, it had to fully, fully grow out completely, you know, months, months and months. Months and I, months of black hair. I was always dyeing my hair like crazy colors and stuff in high school and doing a terrible job. And like, I would like get it on my ears because I would oh, yeah. like the bottom and I would get it on my ears and then I would just have like a purple ear. I looked disgusting. I would also pierce my ears like without, I had two, I had, there was two times where I just had someone pierce my ear. Both were terrible. One time was my cousin pierced it and he numbed it by putting a fish stick on it. And, uh, and then he put a stud in it, and my ear turned purple, but not from hair dye, from infection. And then another time, the girl I was dating, uh, she tried to do it, and the needle broke off halfway through. And so no. it was just, the extraction was fucking brutal. Oh, my God. I would do it right in the cartilage up there. Oh, my God, doing the cartilage. Oh, not even cool, like Cool, dude. Cool, dude. Oh, my God. Okay, let's go to this next photo. Okay, so this is... This is a great example of, again, me being like, who was I? Um, so this is, I, I had this idea. I wanted to go to Sears to have uh, family pictures taken. And my father was not, uh, my father was not part of our family at the time. And so it was my mother, my brother, and my brother's girlfriend at the time. And I tried to sell them on going to Sears to take family portraits, like jokey family portraits. But I, I was astounded at the no that I like the resounding no way. And then so I called my buddy Oren, who remains one of my best friends and who was at the same school as I. And, um, and I said, get on your Sunday's best. We're going to Sears. And so we went to Sears, we got really high. And we went to Sears and we just rented, you know, a little session in the Sears photography. And this was one of the pictures the guy had, they had all these dumb pro I mean, it was total like the guy was like, what the fuck is going on? Um, yeah, is that a giant? O? Yeah, because his name was Oren, he held an O. We were very creative, very creative Got people. it, got and it. And you were like peeking out from behind Oren. Yeah, sort of a cutesy little like, hello, kind of move. He was a bigger gentleman, still is, but, uh, and that hair is gone. But, um, but yeah, we, so we just had this weird photo session at Sears and, and I have a, I mean, there's more of them. I, I, yeah, I, there's, I mean, we had all these ones printed up. They were just, it was really weird. Um, was that expensive? I, it must not have been because otherwise it would not have happened. Uh, yeah, it, it must not have been. I mean, I was working at the time. I was working at comedy sports on the weekend, so maybe I had some cash. But, but yeah, I wouldn't have paid a lot. I mean, so I don't know, but it couldn't have been a lot. I know I always want to do those old time photos on the boardwalk, but yeah. cost prohibitive. Those things. Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, this was like, a, this was like at Northridge in Milwaukee, like this was, and this is fucking, you know, 97 or 98. So it's like, it, things, things were a little cheaper back in my days. It's, that's also such a fun level of mischief where like, you kind of feel like you're doing something bad, but in reality, like you're just paying money to Sears and some yeah. old guy, like whatever, man. Yeah. And like thinking like, this guy's, this guy's going to think this is fucking great. And the person is just like, just get out of here as soon as possible. You know, <laughs> like just completely over it, not finding any humor in it. My life is hell. Yeah, I was. <laughs> yeah. so yeah. I'm being, I'm, I, my two bosses right now are two, stu two stoned high school kids. So things aren't great over here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like the last thing I want to do is deal with your antics, but. Yeah. Yeah, well, he's, we're holding an O because his name's Oren. He's like, awesome. We're, we have about two more left. <laughs> so, hurry. So, by the end of high school, once you had graduated, did you really, like, did you have a plan to do comedy at that point? What was your vision leaving high school of what you were going to do? Well, I knew I was going to, uh, I knew I was going to Emerson College in Boston, and, um, and I didn't really know. I mean, I think my, I think what I thought it was going to be was like a serious actor. Um, I think I really thought that that was going to be it because I'd gotten into this, this theater program there. Um, but then really what it became was it became just a place to meet funny, like-minded people. Like my writing partner, I met my third day of college, you know, and like we've worked together since. So 
it just kind of was a breeding ground to meet a bunch of people who were also kind of like me who weren't really sure what they were going to do but knew they wanted to be be funny but i i i don't know i don't know what i thought in my head i mean i i probably I probably, again, I mean, I, w I was like, I, part of me thought I'd go to LA right away instead of college. And then when I was actually going to college, I think I just thought, you know, this will just be a quick, quick session into my fast fame and fortune when I moved to Los Angeles at 24. Mm -hmm. 10 know. by 30. It's yeah, 100% uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, on all those things. So did you like, when you're, because you were saying, you know, you weren't, a good student so when it came time to like apply to colleges and you were like shit I got to get into a theater program was there like did you have to like hustle some stuff I mean I imagine for that it was more of like an audition type situation but it was it was my my grades were shit I mean I couldn't I, I was accepted into a couple theater programs that I couldn't go to the college because of uh because of grades so, um, you know, it was shitty because I, I was like, I really wanted to go to BU and I got into the BU theater program, but the guy there and then, um, and then I was, you know, they wouldn't take me because of my grades. Emerson, I mean, Emerson is like kindergarten college and they were like, you seem too stupid for this. <laughs> um, so, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, it was, it was mainly auditioning and it was mainly, I had to write a, I had to write a, you know, a little story and I wrote it about, at, at Comedy Sports I ended up being a ballet parker where I would wear a tutu and I would pirouette people around a parking lot and like direct them to spaces. And so, um, and so I wrote a story about that and, and people seemed to like that. And then it was just auditioning with monologues. And uh, again, the, the teacher, Miss Woodard, really helped me get it together. Um, the funniest story is that when I was auditioning for North Carolina School of the Arts, they were like, and what's your song? And I was like, oh, I don't have a song. And they were like, oh, you need a song. And so I, I got faxed over um, some Hello Dolly lyrics. And I remember my brother and I were in a hotel. My brother came with me. We had to go to Chicago for it. My brother came with me and we had a hotel. And I remember at the first line, he's just like, well, just practice it with me. And I just go, okay, I go, put on your Sunday's best. There's lots of world out there. And we both lost our shit laughing. <laughs> we were like, this is not good. <laughs> and, then, and then I went and did it. And they, I mean, I swear they were sitting there like, this is a fucking disaster. And I just, you know, that, that feeling that I became, I've now become so familiar with where you're bombing and you have to continue. Um, you're in sync, but also not even just bombing, you're singing and you're sing bombing. bombing. Sing bombing is, it's a different, it's a different bomb. The sing, the sing bomb, I, I have one from when I was auditioning to Into the, on, for Into the Woods at my high school that still haunts me, a single. It's tough. It's tough. Horrible. I was like, it's you know tough. what? I started off in the wrong place and I am not going to get this back. That's actually very well put because I think it, it really is, you've got to hit that for, you know, and I'm sure I went in there, and I probably went too high. I was like, put on your Sunday's bed. And I was like, oh, this is over. I'm a dead man singing here. This is dead. I'm <laughs> not going to. Continue the song. Oh, there, there's three and a half minutes left to this. This is going to be hell on earth. And it's me just saying the same shit again. Like yeah, I, it's just yeah, yeah. with no band. It's the the build is not there. It's not good. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I mean, I remember it ending, and my friend Megan literally was like, "That was really bad." <laughs> oh well, that was what was great about having my brother there. Like I, it, we both acknowledged that I was like I was taking a walk to death row when I was going to North Carolina School of the Arts to sing. Oh, that's so beautiful and I feel like that that brings us right to the end so we always end uh with the same question which is if you could tell young Gareth anything what would you tell him oh my god <laughs> um I yeah I mean well the truth is that I think I think a lot of it is how you have to figure it out on your I wouldn't say keep on going you're fine but there was a lot of like self-discovery that came from being, you know, because my, my parents were English, there was always just a lot of figuring out I had to do. So I think what I would say to him, because he was totally lost still, is you will figure this out. Oh, well, that's very And then I would rip the gloves off and the sunglasses off and I'd say, dress like a regular human when you go to fucking prom, you weirdo. <laughs> yeah, um, you will figure this out, but also you look like the Babadook and- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
All right, Gareth, this was such a wonderful episode. Thank you so much for doing a this. pleasure. Show. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, and for everybody listening at home, this has been the Roast of Your Teenage Self podcast.